That is one of our favorite, uh, favorite stories, children's books from that one and Fly Away Kite. I don't know if you've ever heard of Fly Away Kite, but that's another one that's just tremendous. Oh, I am so, so excited to be back in Matthew's gospel with you all. Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, I enjoyed the Christmas series or Advent series, but to be working our way back through a book again, to me, it just feels so, so right. And, um, and the, the title, as you see today, is Reset and Refocus. Um, so we live in a part of the world with just amazing freedoms and, and just incredible opportunities, do we not? For the most part, we don't worry about um, our neighboring country invading us with their army. I don't know about you, but I don't lay awake at night thinking of, of Canada invading the United States. No, we don't, we don't have to worry about that. Um, there's plenty of job opportunities. There's, there's no shortage of food, plus the entertainment and recreational activities that we have are limitless, even to a fault, <laughs> right? So many opportunities. We're so blessed. All of these great things are exactly why the new year is a great time for us to do a reset and a refocus. And so I'm excited to share with you today from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Uh, but before we do that, let's go to our memory verse. And would you recite this with me? In Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So God, we come to you right now. We ask your blessing on the reading from Matthew chapter 6 and some other passages. Lord, I trust that you will take your scriptures that we know are living, the living word, and Lord, we know that you will take them and multiply them in ways that go beyond even what this simple sermon that I wrote would be able to do. Holy Spirit, you are capable of taking it and doing exactly what your purpose is for it, and so I ask for that purpose to come to fruition I entrust it to you. Lord, would you just open us up? Open up our hearts to you. And Lord, any distractions that are going on in our minds. I know I feel a little distracted this morning, Lord. And I just ask that you quiet those. Quiet the distractions. And please, silence any any commotion that could come from our enemy or his minions, silence them so that we can hear clearly from you. We love you so much, God. We ask your blessing on this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible and wish to look at a paper one in front of you, it's pages 964 uh, to 965 in the Pew Bible, um, and it's 6 verses 19 through 24. It's a short section, uh, and uh, yet it is packed with such a punch. It says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye 
is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. I meant to bring that other book up with me. Can you bring that for me? Thank you. Thank you, dear. So, he starts off, these are Jesus' words. If you have a Bible that has the red letter version, these are red. These are Jesus' words. And he starts off with, do not lay up, or your translation might say, store up earthly treasures. Earthly treasures. Um, I've just got to ask, okay, this is totally, I'm just totally shifting on you all, okay, right now. So with a show of hands, who else in this room, uh, like me, and is a geek and loves a good thesaurus? A thesaurus. Yes, I knew Nikki's hand would fly up. A thesaurus. One of my favorite books. You might say, you're crazy. A thesaurus? Yeah. Interesting here, back, back on our subject. So the word here for treasure that we just looked at is the Greek word thesauros, which means a treasury, a storehouse, or it can mean the valuables that go into that treasury or coffer, if you will. And so sure enough, thesaurus got its title because it is a treasury of words. Amen, sister? Yeah, yeah, coming from our local our writer here. So why are we not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth? Why is that? Well, it's because they are temporary. That's why treasures on earth are temporary. You have expensive clothing, Moths can get, get in and destroy them, right? Uh, you, you know, or just one mistake in the washing machine. So much for that. One wrong setting on the iron. Whoo, done. You have something metal that is precious to you? Oh, yeah, rust can destroy that. Attack it, eat away at it. Plus, it can all be stolen. All these things can be stolen from us. We'll go up in flames, you, you name it. I just think also about the, the interesting, uh, you know, the security industry. Think about this with me. The security industry, cameras, video doorbell systems, right? Um, they, they're so affordable now, which is great. Uh, we actually, Susan and I, uh, just installed a couple of ring doorbells on the parsonage. Keep that in mind, all of you. You try to do something sneaky around the parsonage. We're watching. We see you. No, in all seriousness, though, think about the security and just how they get more and more complex. And, of course, the more valuable items you have to protect, the more elaborate those security systems get, right? I mean, you think about... Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but my mind immediately goes to the movie National Treasure, you know, and just the security systems that go into even uh, just protecting the Declaration of Independence. But it says, but store up heavenly treasures. Guess what? Nothing can touch heavenly treasures. Not mo moths, not rust, nor thieves. Nothing can touch the heavenly treasures because these are treasures that just, uh, they have eternal value. They have eternal value. And then Jesus says some troubling words that 
where your treasure is, or might I even say, or treasury is, is where your heart is. Another way of saying it is, your treasures reveal your priorities. Our treasures reveal our priorities, uh, your heart, your motives. That's what our treasuries do, our treasures do. They reveal what our motives are. And I know that's a tough, <laughs> please hear me, I'm preaching this with conviction, all right? I'm preaching this all with conviction because this is real and this is true. And if we're honest with ourselves, we will say, yeah, they really do. You know, the things I own, you know, the, the, my, my possessions, my treasures, things that I really elevate high in my life, they reveal my motives. And I guess I have to ask also, have you ever taken a moment to consider why you purchased something? Man, it's tough. Why purchase, did you purchase something? And, you know, we have to also come to this truth that it is okay to have possessions. It's not like God you know, wants us to no, you're allowed to have, you know, you're allowed to have a structure to live in and uh, yeah, a couch, recliners off the table. No, you're not allowed to have a recliner. That's luxury. You know, no, no, I'm not up here to, to preach on having possessions of any kind. But what are our motives behind the possessions? Your treasure might not be something shiny in the garage. No, might not be. But your treasure is what you're giving not only your money, but also your attention and time to a lot. Where does your time and attention go to a lot? It's your treasure. This uh, one study Bible, I thought it was interesting, said materialism may be God's greatest rival competing for the allegiance of human hearts. Isn't that true? Materialism may be God's greatest rival competing for the allegiance of human hearts. And next, possessions or materialism can distract us from seeing that we are spiritually desperate. Isn't this true? Because when we feel like, I've got all I want, I've got anything I need, and matter of fact, I've got more than I need, I've got so much, I, I have so many things, I, I'm comfortable, and when I'm not, I can buy something to make myself more comfortable, like that. I can just go buy it, and I'm comfy. Because we live in a place where all we want is to be comfortable, and we need to make sure everybody's comfortable. I know I'm meddling. <clears throat> but it's true. It's all about comfort. And so it's no surprise that these things are uh, great rivals to our seeing a, a desperate need for Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Desperate need for Jesus. I like how Dr. Ralph Early said it. He said, to lay up treasures here is to be earthbound. <laughs> to lay up treasures here is to be earthbound. You know, but the reality, folks, is that this earth is not our home. Treasures make us earthbound. And uh, let me just correct myself. Our motives on treasures, our motives that are incorrect towards our treasures make us earthbound. Treasures themselves don't. But it's our motive for those treasures make us earthbound. 
And we are not bound here. This isn't home. This is not home. This is temporary. You are an alien, a sojourner. You're just passing through. This is just part A. (laughs) It's just part A, folks. And I feel like we must be, I must be reminded of this time and time again. Why? Because we just go through our motions. We get up another day. It's, it's another day, another dollar. I get up. I do my thing. Um, off to work I go. You know, it's, it's just we go through these motions, and sometimes I feel like we need to have a time to reset. We have to reset We must reset. What do those steps look like? Well, first of all, you got to recognize, I need to reset. I'm kind of in a a funk. I'm in a groove. I'm in in this so-so just kind of going through the motions like this robot, and there's this reality that this this is just part A. Um, there, There are greater things going on here. Also, ask God to supernaturally empower you to do so. You know, I don't know why it is, but we, we forget that we are not to be doing this in our own power, to have this time of reset, this time to kind of, as we look at what we have, and when I say reset, I mean reset how you see your possessions, how you see your treasures. Do a little bit of a reset up here in your head. Put them in their place, because it's all they are is possessions. Material things. And and lastly, I put create tangible actions. Actions that that help you to determine what is it that I have and how am I looking at these things in an unhealthy way. Do you realize you can change how you think? You can change how you think. Don't believe the lie that says, oh, I can't help it. It's just who I am. I, I just, it's just how God wired me. I, there's nothing I can do about it. Yes, there are some things that are hardwired. There are some things that are personality. But guess what? You can change, and you can change how you think. And, and, and by all means, there, there's plenty of scriptures that say you can change how you think. Matter of fact, you can be transformed in how you think. Um. So the book that I had Susan bring up to me is uh, My Utmost for His Highest, and I was reading just yesterday, so the January 6th devotional, the first paragraph, and I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. (laughs) This, This is great. So Oswald Chambers says this, worship is giving God the best that he has given you. Be careful what you do with the best you have. Whenever you get a blessing from God, give it back to him as a love gift. Take time to to meditate. Take time to meditate before God and offer the blessing back to him in a deliberate act of worship. Now there's a great point for us to, a great thing for us to do. You get something great. You get, maybe it's this great Christmas present you got that you think, this is the bomb. It is so great. I just love it. It just, it's the greatest gizmo, or maybe you just gifted it to yourself uh, with some Christmas money you got. You take a moment and you say, wow, thank you so much. God, I just believe that this is a blessing from you, and I give it back to you. Help me just to give it, to keep it in the right perspective. So Chambers goes on to say, If you hoard it for yourself, it will turn into a spiritual dry rot. (laughs) If you hoard it for yourself, it'll turn into a spiritual dry rot as the manna did when it was hoarded in Exodus 16. Ooh. God will never allow you to keep a spiritual blessing completely for yourself. It must be given back to him so that he can make it a blessing to others. Isn't that just a great perspective? We give it back to him. I I get something precious. I get something great, and I say, 
uh, and maybe it's even like a nice Bible or something that's pretty special, and you say, well, thank you so much, Lord. I just offer it back to you. You've blessed me with this. Help me to bless others with it. It's about our motives on how we see the things we possess, which leads us right into verses 22 through 24. And what do those say? Let me take a drink and I'll read it to you. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If we then, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve the two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So normally when we think of the eye, we think of what the eye receives, right? Um, Dr. Joe, you know, he and, and, and Amy, they, they are interested in what can someone see? What, 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 what do people see? And why aren't they seeing properly? Uh, yes, even looking at the physical attributes and, and just the, the amazing connections inside our eyeballs so we, because we think of what the eye receives. So much we think of that. It does receive, but think about what your eyes give. What your eyes give. Are you interested? Are you bored? Are you mad? Are you tired? Are you happy? Are you crazy? Your eyes can communicate that all. Yeah? Your eyes can communicate that. Now, some people are pretty good at bluffing, or at least they think they are. You can have other people that are very good at reading eyes. Don't, don't you agree? And maybe some of you are like, yeah, I, I know that. Don't you love it when you're talking to somebody, and next thing you know, they're you think the eyes aren't telling a story? They are. Or you're talking to somebody and their eyes go like this. And you're like, what? Their eyes communicate. The eyes give. They don't just receive. Your eyes can communicate that. And, and so verse 22 calls your eyes a lamp. Isn't that interesting? Your eyes are called a lamp. That word, that Greek word can also mean candle, and it literally means, you know, some, you know the, the light or candle that's put on a, a pedestal for light for the room. That's your eye. That, that, that's your eyes. And it says that the healthy eye brings in light, so here we have this taking in, but would you agree it also gives, the healthy eye also gives light. Uh, according to Jewish literature, the eye and the heart are very similar. So the eye, so when, when in the scriptures you read about the eye or the heart, many times those are kind of, they're, co they're close cousins, maybe even siblings, according to Jewish culture. And this, this lamp reveals what's inside. Showing or revealing deceit or corruption or really confirming righteousness that your motives are right. I mean, I, I think of so many things when it comes to the eyes. I, I think of, of those in law enforcement uh, that what do they do? They do eye tests. Follow my finger, right? How many times have you ever watched cops or videos of you know, just trying to do, uh, see, seeing if somebody is, is high on something or, or inebriated and follow the finger. You know, it's eye test. The eyes tell a story. The eyes give, and they are a lamp, as it says, a lamp. Verse 24 says that one cannot be both dark and light. You can't be both. Not both. You're either dark or light. And of course, we know what those mean, darkness and light. 
So I have to ask an important question, and that is, what are your eyes fixed on? What are my eyes fixed on? Again, eyes, they have this two-way communicate. What are, what are they fixed on? Which means, what are they receiving? But that also does also... <laughs> I just have to say, you ladies know this, when some guy's eyes aren't where they belong. Let's be real, folks. We're family. Yeah, it's true. Your eyes tell. <laughs> Your eyes can get you into big trouble. I think about when you're driving. When you're driving, does it matter where your eyes are? You better believe it. I get called out on it all the time. Don't, Susan, behave yourself. She's over there laughing. Might have even happened on our vacation. Don't let dad drive in the mountains. You're scared to death of me driving in the mountains. I wouldn't know why. Man, look at that. That's... You go where your eyes are, right? You look to the right and you start drifting to the right. Woo! Hope there's a guardrail. Oh my goodness. I love telling on myself. Oh. So what do we do? What do we do? We refocus. We refocus. We refocus. Like what Psalm 119 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Fix my eyes on your ways, Lord. Proverbs 4.25, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Why? Because when our eyes wander, yes, that's when we get in trouble. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you have blinders on like a horse to go forward, but it means I, it's this idea of my eyes are trained where they're supposed to be trained to. Because they are, they're both physical and spiritual habits that we need to change here. Ephesians 1.18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. It's this, again, eyes that are trained. Yes, physical and spiritual. Philippians 3.17, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. We have so much to learn. I have so much to learn. And let me just tell you all, as, as we conclude this time, I want to just exhort you this morning, as, and even as we participate in communion after this, to do a reset in your mind, a reset in your mind. Remember your desperate need for Jesus and that the love of possessions, it, yeah, it dimin diminishes your need for a Savior. If you elevate possessions, you get to a point where you don't see a desperate need for a Savior. And also, let me urge you to consider your eyes. They tell a story. What do you set your eyes on? Refocus your eyes. As we go into this new year, it is a great time to reset and refocus. And even as we do that through communion today, it's a reset. Yes, Lord, this is a new start. This is a new day. It's a new week, and it is a new year. May we do it, do all things for God's glory as we want, long to grow and hunger to grow nearer and nearer to Jesus into a deeper fellowship with him and longing to see others in this place. Yes, grow and come to, to a place where our roots go deeper our spiritual roots grow deeper and we become stronger. And what do we do? We, we long to see others come into this faith that we have as well because we know that it's special, folks. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much just for how you work and move in us, and you're so patient with us. Lord, I pray and ask that these, these thoughts of resetting and refocusing would just permeate our minds, and just not just our minds, Lord, but that they would be a part of who we are, that we would just be people who long to have a complete reset and refocus in our lives, being sure of what we're focusing on, what we're elevating. Lord, you, set, you, you, you want to have no other things before you. You want, us to have, you want us to have you on the throne of our lives and nothing or no one else. So may we have that mind as well, that you are the king of our lives. You are the sovereign one over us, our master. And right now today, Lord, we put you back on the throne If we've moved you, we put you back. Thank you so much, Lord, for this time to reset and refocus. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to have a time to just worship the Lord uh, with communion today. And uh, so if, if you've never been with us when we have communion... Let me just give a little bit of, uh, I guess, house rules, if you will. Number one, we don't police who 